So this is one of our units on freedom training, and this one is about wholeness in the mind, emotions, and body. So we're going to talk first about wholeness as being the standard for our spirit, our soul, and our body, um, and then what wholeness looks like even in the midst of suffering and trial, and then soul brokenness, um, what happens when we don't have wholeness, we have fear and anxiety. So first off, we had an activation. You can go ahead and journal this one. It's, it's a one of our percentage questions of what percentage of peace do you currently have? Zero to 100. Ask God, and usually right away we'll hear something. Um, and then, was my peace stolen or did I give it away? So we're going to try to get back the, the percentage of peace that we currently don't have. And then forgive anyone, release any situations. Just take some time with God on this. You can even pause um, the video at this point. And then at the end, ask again, what is the percentage of peace that you have? And it doesn't have to be 100%. I mean, that, that obviously is ideal. But, you know, 80 90% having peace, you know, if you're down at 20 30%, it's just really not a good place to be, be living. So um, to just take a few minutes on this. So starting with, with this whole idea of wholeness, so we see in the Old Testament, uh, we look up the word peace, and the word is shalom. And this word l means, as we, we look it up in um, the Strong's Concordance, it means completeness, wholeness, health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation or discord. Shalom comes from the root, root verb shalom, meaning to be complete, perfect, and full. So this idea of completeness is sometimes um, given in the Bible more through the word of peace than anything. In the New Testament, the idea of God of peace making us whole is also given. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see in this verse, we talked the, uh, during our first session about our spirit, our soul, and our body. And this, this is how we're made up as a human. And this is just saying, may all of these parts of you be whole and have peace. So we're not meant to have illness and suffering or emotional wounds. Th these kinds of things start, start taking a toll on, on who we are and, and the whole point of God of peace coming in and making us whole. So again, we have another verse. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So we see here that peace contradicts this idea of fear. Um, and, and heart, pr heart issues, troubles in the heart. And then let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. So we just want to set this idea of wholeness and peace here. This is, this is kind of the idea of, of what we're going to talk about, and that it is meant for our whole spirit, our soul, and our body. So again, that is the verse for the morning. I'll just keep it up here. So our spirit, our soul, and our body are intertwined. And wholeness is a standard that God's created us for. And we can just talk about what happens when we're not in wholeness. There's an overreaction and there's an underreaction. So an overreaction, we, we talk about being anxious, um, having an overactive immune system, immune system disorders like lupus or allergies. or We see these things in our body when when we have this overreaction. And then we have the underreaction as well. In our, in our uh, soul, we might be depressed or have a stoic um, outlook. Uh, in our physical bodies, we might have a depressed immune system, which then allows cancer or viruses. And so we know when we're out of balance. And so we're, we're talking here about peace and wholeness and what that looks like. And then, again, what it, what it looks like when we, we move from either side of this. And so we just want to say here that, that we, we want to become a people that doesn't accept anything except for wholeness as our standard. We don't want to just be living with parts of, parts of our lives that are broken and be okay with that. Those are places that we should be asking God uh, regularly to heal. So it's, this is just kind of setting a new normal. It's kind of the idea of, of this whole unit. Okay, so the idea of dysfunction is not created by God. So we could have, we can have, um, brokenness in our body or in our souls. We can have illness and diseases, you know, cancers, uh, schizophrenia, mental disorders, diabetes or heart disease. These can all be very physical things, you know. Um, we put schizophrenia and some of the other stuff in our mind even. You know, you, you can literally have a lesion on your brain that causes, that causes um, issues I in both your body and your mind. Um, you can have emotional issues with depression, anxiety, insecurity, fear, stoicism. Uh, one thing we wanted to point out, there is a healthy place for emotions. We are supposed to be a people full of happiness and joy and, um, 
and there is times for short-term grief you know if you have a loved one who's died th there there is time for healthy emotions of grief and those kinds of things but these are different than ongoing depression or anxiety or fear um, again we have m our mind and mental illness and schizophrenia other issues that can go on in our mind that can affect us you know depression can even show up kind of as a mind thing uh, so we just wanted to say like these are not created by God and these are really things that we need to be seeking him uh, alone and in community as the God of peace to bring a wholeness to to our whole being okay so again we live with a new spirit in us uh, we also have a renewed mind and soul uh, that actually takes some amount of effort we have to spend time reading the word uh, meditating on the world word and God also um, does healing for the body so we can be praying for that as well um, but on the other side of it even whole people still have warfare so we need to know that life's not going to be perfect even if we're whole but so we need to be able to separate is this an issue in my life that I'm having because of warfare is this an issue in my life because of um, that I'm not whole you know am I depressed or or am I just you know in a, a deep spiritual battle right now uh, but yet there's nothing really wrong or broken in in the internal workings of what's going on within me so these are things we need we need to know um, kind of y you have to spend time with God and discern through them again we're not going to cover what causes brokenness in this unit we're just going to set the standard that brokenness is not of God uh, a lot of us have grown up in families and other places where brokenness is normal and we start to think it's normal because it's what we see. We see a world around us that's anxious or fearful or depressed and we start to think that that's okay. Um, and I think just just right now we're just trying to reset the mindset that, that we're really supposed to be a people of peace and joy. And that should be the consistentness of our life. And it's not coming from a condemning place of, of saying this, but it's coming from a place where it's an inviting people in to be healed. It's inviting us to start into a process with God in healing. Okay, so again, the Holy Spirit does the work. He saved, so this is talking about Christ. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration of renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So we want to we want to say here that, that this, you know, there, there's no condemning because we are broken or because, you know, we're living in a world that's that's very difficult those kinds of things. The, the work here is really going to be done, the internal work of regeneration is going to be done by the Holy Spirit. This is not um, more hours of us introspecting or us trying to figure things out with our mind. This is really going to be work of the Holy Spirit um, and we need to be partnering with him in what he's doing, speaking with him in prayer and, and really partnering in this process of, of what he's doing in our lives. And then Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So here we also see this as a work of Christ and, and a work of the word in us. And so as Christ speaks to our hearts, as we read our Bible, as we start to regenerate our mind and our souls in the word of God, um, we also find a free freedom and a wholeness and, and um, just that peace of God that, that permeates everything. So we do want to put this out there that this, this isn't a work of man. This is going to have to be a work of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus and of the word in our life. And so... So just to kind of keep that as in the forefront. So our spirits have not been merely transformed by Christ. Rather, old self died, and now we have a new life and a new spirit. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you m also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ Jesus. So we know that, that as far as our spirits are concerned, we've been given a new spirit and we've been given the Holy Spirit inside of us. And so we have this completely new part, this completely raised to life part of us and a live part inside of us. Um, and, and that's really the part that communes with God and the part that, that's healed and has this ability to connect into the peace of God and the wholeness of God. 
But then we have our soul, and, and let's just start by talking about one part of our soul, which is our mind. So the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But we have the mind of Christ. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. My soul will be satisfied as with a fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with the joy, with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. So these are just some of the, the ideas we have about how we get this peace in our minds. First off, we have the minds of Christ, and we need, we need to claim that. Um, second off, uh, there, there is some things that we can do um, to, to continue in this, uh, we have we have to take control of our thoughts and give them to Christ, um, and let Him discern through them. But we are supposed to be setting our minds on what's true and honorable, just, pure and lovely, commendable, excellent and praiseworthy, and that could be Christ Himself, Heaven, God, um, the attributes of God, things He's been doing. But those are the things we want to be looking for, and those are the things we want to be looking for in each other. We want to really be looking at the good stuff in life. Uh, not the negative things, um, as we like practice these things, right? And the God of peace will be with you. So, so you know, as your peace, you can feel that peace move or leave you in your mind. You know, get your mind centered again, uh, back on the things that are are lovely and pure. Uh, again, it's it's what we meditate on that really matters, as far as our mind is concerned. So then again, we have another idea, uh, part of our soul, which is our heart. And so this is going to talk about some of how to have wholeness in our heart. So hope, peace, trust brings health to the soul. Um, why are you da you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So this is an idea of turmoil inside. This is kind of like an emotional thing, uh, like troubled in internally. And, and the answer here is to hope in God. Uh, so we see that putting our hope, our peace, and our trust in God brings health to our soul. Again, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. So we keep seeing these themes. Actually, there were quite a few verses that we found on hope. Uh, as, as our soul is in turmoil, if we put our hope in God, um, put our peace in God, put our trust in God, that these things all flow from him. And this will bring a wholeness to, to our emotional place, to our heart, to the things that concern us. It's really getting our eyes off the problems and um, onto where they should be, into a God that is in control, into a God that, that has our, our uh, best in mind and, and not on the issues and the, even the feelings that we're currently having. And then we have body wholeness, and this gets into physical healing. The Lord sustained him on his sick bed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. So again, we have to look to God a lot of the time for, for healing. I mean, there is our part where we partner, we eat healthy, uh, we, we go to the doctor if we need to, you know, whatever it might be that God, you and he have been talking about. Um, but, but we really are going to look to God and, and pray, uh, even as, you know, we're going to the doctor or whatever, that, that he... As, as Jesus would bring us into full health. And if anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So here we have... Uh, people who are sick, they go to the elders, they anoint them with oil. So this is corporate prayer for those who are sick, and it's a prayer of faith, and the Lord raises him up. And if he committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Okay, so there's this idea that sometimes uh, sickness is a result of a sin, and sometimes it's not. I mean, we've had plenty of stories where someone will forgive someone, and their back pain will immediately leave. This would be one of those cases where we need to take care of a sin issue before the physical healing comes. In other cases, People are just, their body's broken. Um, they just need a prayer of faith. So this this is kind of an idea we have I I in Scripture is just uh, we are supposed to be praying over our sick bodies. Okay. Sometimes illness is a result of our own actions. 
or sin and repentance is required. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, and I have sinned against you. So even if it is our own actions that caused it, uh, repentance brings us into a right place with God. And, and, and we see most in these verses that God then does bring the healing. So for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Again, just to point out here, um, this was very uh, known sin. So this wasn't something that, that in the Psalms here, David didn't know he'd done. He was very aware of what had happened. Uh, he, he was able to ask for forgiveness for it and then see the healing come and become king and all of this and, and restored, you know, in as being king as he was and everything. So just to keep in mind, it God doesn't hide things from us if we ask him if it was a sin issue. So just just to be out there with this, like um, we don't want anybody to feel condemned like they're sick because of sin if they don't know what that sin was. Okay. God knows us better than we know ourselves and we need to ask him about where we are dysfunctional. So like I said, this healing process is not just introspection. We're not gonna just give a list of questions. We're gonna go through the questions and be like, yeah, that's exactly what got hurt and how it got hurt and this is how it gets fixed. So the whole whole process of knowing what's broken um, and what and how it gets fixed and all of that is it's all a process of communion with God uh, in in most of our experience and so we need to be in a relationship um, an open relationship communicating with God and with others around us the Lord searches the heart and tests the mind to give every man according to his ways according to the fruit of his deeds and search me O God and know my heart try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting so again, just like the last one, if there's sin, you really want to be asking God to search your heart. Um, you don't want to be searching for yourself. You, it, it's just one of those places. It's it's very easy to have condemning thoughts come in, that that really aren't God. You want you want His thoughts, and sometimes He has some very stern things to say to us, and other times, you know, He has very loving things. Um, not that his sternness isn't loving, but uh, sometimes they're just very positive things that we just don't realize uh, we need to hear. And so this is this is all process with God in relationship with him. Okay. There's always going to be an internal war. Sanctification is a process. So like getting m more healed and more whole is always going to be a part of our lives. Uh, it's something we're always going to be walking with God with for the because for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So again, flesh here does not mean just our physical body. Flesh means our sinful desires. Um, they're the things that, that we just want to do. Eat too much or... Um, watch things we shouldn't you know they can be in our soul they can be in our body uh it's it's really the things that are at war against the the holy spirit inside of us and um, these things are at war so that way we don't slip into sin obviously the we need to be leaning and on the side of the holy spirit um, all the time so just to say uh, there is this war you're, there's temptation as long as we're walking in this world you know there's temptation and things that come in we can we can be winning um, but we st still will have a war so you you can't just go through inner healing and hope that the outcome is that there will be completely no war now you can say i had peace through it and wholeness through that um, but let's just uh, we want to kind of give a realistic view of of what the process is like because we've known people that have gone through the process and wanted inner healing to bring them to a place where it was finally over and and that kind of view of of wholeness is, is not very healthy. Okay, so wholeness does not be mean being free from battles or suffering. So you can be a completely whole person and still have trials and suffering. So count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So you're going to have trials and tests. I mean, we see see Jesus uh, going to the cross, you know, this, this was obviously a huge trial in his life, um, and it wasn't because he'd done anything wrong. He, he had, this was his calling, and as much as he's sweating blood in, in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before, uh, these are intense 
moments of suffering and trials and testing um, that we even see Jesus through. Okay, so, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Okay. So here we see that suffering is being likened to the punishment that a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler might, might get. And this kind of suffering would be a prison, a death, a flogging, an insult, right, of a murderer or a thief or a criminal. Um, sickness and inner dysfunction is not implied here. So we don't see that a murderer or a thief or something would, would somehow have a sickness or anxiety attacks or something. Tho those things are what we're, we're trying to separate out here. There is suffering, but then there are things that that we suffer with that, that we're really supposed to be looking for wholeness in. And so that's kind of the thing that we're, we're trying to separate here. Is this a fiery trial, you know, where I've been preaching Christ and they've been throwing stones at me? Or is this just, you know, I live in this fallen world and my, my body is physically falling apart and I need to go to God in prayer to have this trial removed? Um, because it, this kind of suffering removed, uh, because it's not the kind of trial we have seeing here. Uh, so here we see Jesus in wholeness, right? He had full wholeness, but yet he still went through stuff, uh, temptations and what we would consider trials. So Jesus did not sin. He didn't have any open doors in his life. He didn't have any garbage. He didn't have any problems, and still Satan came to him. And after 40 days of fasting, when he was in probably the height of weakness, the temptation came. So it wasn't like day one that Satan shows up. It's day 40 of him out in a wilderness fasting. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So we, we get here that that evil waits for us to be in a weakened state. You know, the day you have the flu or, or you know, you're just having a really rough day with, with something else. Um, and then Satan left for a time and then he was it sounded like he was gonna come back at another time. So we get this idea that you know, a lot of people talk about having open doors and trash in your house, and, and those are all really true. But even in wholeness, we have to realize that there's still going to be temptation. There's still going to be battle. Okay, so whole people still have warfare. Even if you pray over every doorway, evil can still come and tempt as God allows. And we see this again in Job 1. Um, evil presence is not always due to sin or an opening. We have Jesus as the example of this. Uh, Satan himself comes to tempt Jesus, and it's not because... Jesus has done anything wrong. We follow Jesus' example, we quote scripture, and we resist the temptation. And so I think that's generally the thing. We all as Christians need to be able to do this and, and stand up when we need to and, and fight. And fighting means quoting scripture and, and you know resisting whatever the temptation is until the devil departs. And so just generally as a reminder, um, you know, we all, sometimes we want to run to other people or other things like that, but sometimes it is our own job. And, you know, after you've won a big battle, you know, it's very common to get tempted in that same thing again. And, oh, no, it came back. No, it's just temptation. Kick it out again. Quote the scriptures again. Reaffirm, you know, that this battle's done and, and continue on. So just kind of these are some of the, our, our weapons in, in our warfare. It's just holding the line, quoting scripture and resisting what the devil's doing. So we're going to talk a little bit now just about emotional brokenness. So these tend to show up, and I know this is something that probably everyone struggles with, anxiety, fear, worry, stress, and depression. And I know sometimes in the church we use the word stress. No, no, it's not anxiety, it's stress, you know. Or I'm not worried because I know worry isn't the right word to use. It's just stress. Yet we're not supposed to have these things. We're supposed to be in peace. So let's let's not just even use pretty words to try to to cover things up here so in righteousness you shall not be established you shall be far from oppression you shall not fear for and from terror for it shall not come near you so even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me for god gave us a spirit of not of fear but of power and love and self-control so we hear see here that that fear and oppression isn't from god terror any of this that um, we're supposed to be established in God. Uh, even when we're facing death, we shouldn't have fear of evil, you know, the shadow of death. 
you know, when there's things that are pressing us or coming against us, we're, we're not supposed to be walking in fear because fear is not of God. So just setting that as our standard. Um, again, do not be anxious about it anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus so this is a wonderful prescription about anxiety instead of being anxious uh pray uh give thanksgiving you know it, you could be completely worried about and stressed over something but you start praising god and things start changing and we see again this word peace of god and remember peace means wholeness so we start to see that our hearts and our minds are going to be guarded with the wholeness the wholeness that god wants to give us in this peace again anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down but a good word makes him glad so anxiety is something that actually can really bring us into a place that, that we shouldn't be in. Uh, and, and we know that these things, both emotionally and physically, all work together. We know when we're stressed or anxious or worried on a regular basis, we start to have breakdowns in our bodies, too. So we really want to be working with God um, to see these things restored. Okay, so the first thing we do is it's called repent, and that's just changing our mind and actions. We just say, you know, we're agreeing with you, God, that fear and anxiety isn't what you created us for. And in those times, instead, we're going to be using thankfulness and, and other things, uh, quoting scriptures and, and really, really trying to work with you, God, and look to you for, for your ways through this. So let's just take a minute here and everybody can kind of say this together. God, we agree with you that we are to be a people of peace. We ask for forgiveness for all the times we have let fear, worry, and anxiety rule our hearts and minds. We specifically repent of all the times we look at our burdens and try to carry them. I repent of ever agreeing with the enemy of fear. So this is just a time where, you know, if there's things that you've been carrying, to just lay them down with God right now. Um, give him all the burdens, all the anxieties, and then start thanking him for the things that he has been doing. And then, again, we know that this is a black and white issue. We know fear, the words fear, anxiety, and worry, they're not from God. But then there's gray areas. There's always gray areas, right? So there, And these are the areas where, what's the difference between fear and wisdom in a dangerous situation? You know, there is a time not to stand on the edge of a cliff, you know, in a high wind or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and, and we can say, oh, it's a fear of heights. But there's also a wisdom not to, not to do things that are impulsive or dangerous. You know, so, so we do need to have discussions. You know, there, there are gray areas. Um, we're not saying, saying that, you know, there, there isn't times. But we really want to be coming at life from a place of wholeness and peace. And if there's not peace in something, you know, going to God and trying to get that peace. And that's why we started with that first question. God, what percentage of peace do I have right now? And did I give it away or was it stolen from me? And how do, how do you want to give it back to me? How do you want to bring this back into my life? You know, what are those situations in my life where this has just been an ongoing issue, you know, or childhood childhood trauma or something, some place where that peace left and I need it back in a, in a more full sense, in a sense in my emotions, in a sense in my body, wherever it might be. Okay. So just to end today, I'm going to leave some discussion questions. These are great for journaling or discussing with a, you know, a small group somewhere. So what would your life look like or feel like if you were whole? So we'd like to ask these questions. You know, I first off want to put out there that I think personally I would be thinking about everything that's lovely, pure, noble, of good report a lot more, that, that my eyes would be on those things all the time. And then as a secondary question, how does warfare, trials, and problems look different when you're doing it from a place of wholeness, or the word peace here? Um, because we know we're still going to have trials and problems and warfare, even when we're, but, you know, if, if something comes in and we're sitting in a place of peace. Um, when this problem arises, we're not going to react in anger. We're not going to react in despair. We're not going to, you know, have these these areas of brokenness that start showing up. We're not going to fear, you know, where's my my rent payment coming from, or you know, I, I can't believe that person did that to me. You know, you start to realize, no, you know, I'm a whole person here, and this stuff does happen, but it it's a place of overcoming or victory. So, just what does that look like for you? And and asking God. And then an, a third question we have, are there any broken areas of your life you currently accept? And that was the most, most of today, was to look at this idea. A lot of us, I think, just get stuck in seeing what everybody else around us has been doing. You know, our family might have a belief or behavior 
you know, everybody in my family is kind of depressed. They're always looking at bad stuff. We get together and we kind of grumble and complain. You know, that, that might be normal. Um, and, and how are you going to be different in that? How are, how are you going to set the standard to be different? That, that's really not the standard you want to be living down to. You want to be living up to a different standard of peace and joy. Uh, complaining, stress, fear of the dark, anxiety when flying, a bad diet, high blood pressure, fatigue, poor sleep. These are all things that we should have conversations with God about. Um, I particularly had been going after the one about poor sleep, just not being able to sleep through the night, or um, God says that he gives his people good rest. And what does it look like to go to war for having good sleep? Um, being able to, you know, personally have good disciplines to turn everything off on time, which sometimes we have, and then and then also to just allow um, to go to, to war to be able to stay asleep. Uh, and it may take weeks or whatever it might be. And then ask God if there's any underlying lie you're believing about the area of brokenness. You know, sometimes this brokenness comes in and then we feel pow powerless. I need to go get somebody else to pray for me. You know, I just can't win this one by myself. Which is true, we do need corporate things, but there's also this um, powerfulness that, that we're supposed to, to have. Um, some people just have a belief that they're not important because of the brokenness. So just anything that God brings up here, and then ask him to just walk into that place and heal those things to bring a, a further peace. Okay. Uh, and then we had a bunch of questions about the mind uh, to, bring, to bring us more into a place of wholeness. So if you finish journaling those last few questions, what are some good memories? Recrout Recount some of the things God's done in your life. And this should be an ongoing part of your life. You should regularly be reciting the good things God's done. Uh, what are some of the dreams with God for your future? Uh, what do you currently have to be thankful for? What does the kingdom of God look like? Uh, what are your favorite verses and why do they encourage you? You know, the, the question about the kingdom of God might actually take some Bible study here, which is a great way to get your mind on things above. Um, and again, what are your favorite verses and why do they encourage you? Maybe write some of them out and, and write about them for, for a few paragraphs. Or write a poem about one of your favorite verses. Uh, because whatever's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence or praiseworthy, think about these things. So we really want to have our mindset on things above. Oh, I also gave some homework questions in here. You can look at it if, if you really want to. Um, these are not necessarily things that we want to spend a lot of time on today.